current events, Bible prophecy, the ancient past. How does it all fit together? Find out now. This is Pictures of the End. Hello, and thank you for joining me today. My name is Tim Rumsey, and you are listening to Pictures of the End. You can find us online at www.picturesoftheend.com. This program is sponsored by Pathway to Paradise Ministries. And as we begin today, I'd like to let you know about a special offer we have. These episodes that we have been going through here and that we will continue with today um, are summarized in a book I've recently written titled How to Prepare for the End. If you would like a free copy of this book while supplies last, you can call us toll-free at 855-447-8788. That's 855-HIS-TRUTH. Or go online to our website. Again, that is www.picturesoftheend.com. Or you can go to the website for our sponsoring ministry. That is pathwaytoparadise.org. Well, today we are continuing our study about how to prepare for the end of the world, according to the Bible. This is a Bible study that we are looking at. And we have seen a number of important principles emerge in the last several episodes as we have looked at the way God has led people in the past to prepare for great times of crisis. We spent several episodes looking at the story of Noah and the book of Genesis in the Bible describes the destruction of the world in Noah's day when God sends a worldwide flood. And uh, Noah is instructed to build an ark. And uh, after 120 years of building and preaching, Noah saves his family. Uh, Unfortunately, nobody else chooses to get in the ark with him. And we saw several important principles, um, spiritual principles, about how we can prepare today for what the Bible says is coming on this world. We uh, saw that Noah believed what God said. Uh, He had faith in what was unseen. Uh, In Noah's day, according to the Bible, there had never been natural disasters like floods before. In fact, um, as God created this world, there was not even rain. The water, or the world was watered through a mist that arose each night. So when God warned Noah about a flood that was coming on the world, it took a great um, step of faith for Noah to believe the word of God, even when there was no evidence that this could really happen. Uh, we also saw from the story of Noah that Noah moved in fear. In other words, he believed the prophetic message and then he uh, took action based on that message. We also saw from the story of Noah that he prepared an ark uh, according to God's instructions. And uh, God was pretty specific. He gave Noah the the dimensions, the length, the height, the size. He gave him the uh, interior description. You know, there were to be three stories in this ark. And then Noah was to coat it with pitch, uh, kind of an asphalt or tar type covering on both the inside and the outside of the ark. And we saw that spiritually, these are important lessons for us today that uh, the Bible describes Christ's blood, the blood of Jesus Christ, who died for the sins of the world. They can cover us when we ask for forgiveness of our sins. And so that tar that covered the ark was a symbol of the uh, covering that Christ's blood offers to us today when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. We also saw that... um, Noah saved his family, even though, you know, probably most evangelists, if you preached a series that long for 120 years and nobody but your family ends up accepting the message, you could be somewhat discouraged. And I'm sure Noah had his moments of discouragement. Uh, Nevertheless, Noah did save his family, and that is a great role model and encouragement for Christians today that we need to put our families first. And we discussed these things in previous episodes. We also looked at the story of the exodus from Egypt and saw that on the night of the exodus, when the 10th plague fell and the firstborn in all the land of Egypt were destroyed, that um, God offered a, a way of salvation for anybody who was willing to follow his directions. And that way of salvation was to offer a sacrificial uh, lamb or goat and take the blood and smear it on the doorposts of the house. And we discussed in the last several episodes how that blood, again, is a symbol of the blood of Jesus Christ. 
and that we need to not only accept Christ's sacrifice for us and the forgiveness of sins that he offers, but that we also need to uh, apply that blood to our lives through the ministry of Jesus Christ. You know, when Jesus went back to heaven, he uh, didn't go on vacation. He didn't take uh, a victory lap, so to speak, around the universe in his cosmic motorhome. No, he went right to work for us, the book of Hebrews tells us, as our high priest in heaven's sanctuary. And because he is our high priest, he can now give us his strength and his victory over our sins. And this is what it means to apply the blood of Jesus to our lives. Well, we're going to look today at another crisis that God's people face in the Bible, and that is the night of Christ's arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane. And to give some background to what is going to happen here, uh, let's start by uh, reminding ourselves of some of the statements that Jesus had made leading up to his, his death. You know, he tried to warn the disciples what was going to happen to him. And more than once, he told them that he would be um, betrayed into the hands of his enemies, that he would be uh, arrested, that he would be mistreated, and of course, eventually crucified, but also that he would rise again on the third day. And multiple times, Jesus tries to communicate this to his disciples. Unfortunately, uh, even though they heard the words, they really didn't um, understand. You know, sometimes we hear things and it just doesn't register. And this is what happened with the disciples. They heard, they heard what Jesus said, but it didn't really register with them for an important reason, because it did not fit with their ideas. It did not fit with their preconceptions about who the Messiah would be. And Jesus really had to deal with this throughout his entire ministry. Uh, there was a great expectation of the Messiah, you know, a great Savior uh, to come. And um, this, this idea, at least in a vague form, was held even in some nations other than Israel. Uh, there was, at the time that that you know, Jesus was born and um, surrounding his first advent, there was this expectation in much of the world, of course, greatest there in the land of Israel, that a, a, a savior would come to greatly impact the human race. Unfortunately for the Jews, they were looking for more of a political Messiah than they were one that would uh, save humanity from sin. An example of this is found even after the resurrection of Jesus Christ in the book of Acts chapter 1 verse 6. This is just moments before Jesus ascends back up to heaven. And the disciples still don't really understand what the whole mission of Jesus was about. Acts 1 verse 6, they say this, When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Here they are after the death and resurrection of Jesus. Again, Jesus is about to ascend to heaven in just a few minutes, and they still have their minds fixed on this political um, identity of the Messiah. While the Jews desired the advent of the Messiah, they had no true conception of his mission. And why, why didn't they? Well, here's why. They did not seek redemption from sin, but deliverance from the Romans. And the disciples were not alone in this misconception. They were a product of their culture, as we all are, to a greater or lesser degree. And this was the idea that the Jews in Christ's time had, that the Messiah would come as a political conqueror, that through the power of, you know, this messianic figure, uh, Israel would be able to shake off the oppression of Rome. It would uh, break the, the, the bonds of servitude that they were under because of the Roman government, and that Israel would once again be established as the mighty nation that they had been a thousand years before under the the reign of, of David and Solomon. They looked for the Messiah to come as a conqueror to break the oppressor's power and to exalt Israel to universal dominion. Thus, the way was prepared for them to reject the Savior. And in spite of all that the disciples have been through with Jesus, and in spite of listening to him, try to explain for three, three and a half years, 
the purpose of his mission, they still are under the sway of this political idea of what the Messiah was uh, supposed to be in their minds. The people, uh, the Jews in their darkness and oppression, and the rulers, all thirsting for power, longed for the coming of one who would vanquish their enemies and restore the kingdom to Israel. Now, they had studied the prophecies, it's true, but they studied them without spiritual insight. They overlooked those scriptures that point to the humiliation of Christ's first advent and misapplied those that speak of the glory of his second coming. Uh, Pride obscured their vision. They interpreted prophecy in accordance with their selfish desires. You know, there's a great warning there for, um, for us today. As Christians, as we look at the Bible, as we look at Bible prophecy, as we look at what is happening in the world around us, uh, is it possible that we could be in danger of making some of the same errors that Christ's disciples and you know the Jews in general at the time of Christ made? Is it possible that we could uh, take these prophecies that ultimately speak about God's desire to redeem us from the power of sin and apply those prophecies in more of a political way? You know, it happened in the time of Christ. It's very possible that we could make those same mistakes today. You know, today, millions of sincere Christians look for specific events to take place, especially in the Middle East, uh, Israel even more specifically, to signal the final events of Bible prophecy. Now, the Bible has a lot to say about the final events that take place in this world. And I personally believe that we are witnessing many of these or that we are about to witness many of these final events. The, the issue is this. Where is the focus in our study of the Bible? Is it on the political events that happen out there in the world? Or is the focus of our Bible study, is the focus of our uh, personal relationship with the Messiah, Jesus Christ, Is it on what's happening out there in the world, or is it on personal redemption and deliverance from sin? Now, I want to make this clear that even though I believe the most important focus of Bible prophecy is on what God wants to do in our lives individually, that does not mean that Bible prophecy does not also speak of... uh, you know, these great political events that have happened and uh, will continue happening in our world. I believe they do. The, the issue is one of priority and focus. What is most important? You know, uh, let's go back to the disciples and look at the example here. They spent three and a half years walking with the Son of God here on earth, seeing his miracles, listening to him teach and preach, experiencing firsthand the power of God. Um, and yet they still, the, 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 the power of this mindset, these preconceptions, these biases and prejudices that they came about quite naturally, you know, just because they were a product of their culture, those biases and prejudices were so strong. They held such a grip on the disciples that even after three, three and a half years of walking with the son of God, they still didn't get it. Um, And it really took the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came upon them before they could really clearly discern and see these spiritual realities in their true light. I think that's a warning that each one of us needs to take today. You know, if we if we as Christians claim to believe the Bible, if we study Bible prophecy, um, we need to make sure we are studying it according to the principles that God wants us to. And we need to ask for the Holy Spirit to enlighten us, to give us uh, wisdom and discernment so that we don't take these prophecies and go the wrong direction with them or, you know, neglect to understand the most important truths that uh, God has for us in those. And again, the, the core of the Bible's message, the core of all Bible prophecy is what God is doing about the problem of sin. Uh, political and military events, It's not that they're not important, but they come second to this primary focus of what is God doing about sin. Now, with that background in place, let's dive into the actual crisis here that we are looking at today. How did Jesus try to prepare his disciples for the end? And um, 
the end in this case was Christ's arrest and then his crucifixion. We're going to take up our story here in the book of Matthew, chapter 26. Now, in this chapter, uh, the first part of the chapter deals with the Last Supper that Jesus eats with his disciples. Um, He explains the significance of the bread that is broken at that meal, representing his body. He speaks about the significance of the wine uh, or the grape juice that they are drinking together, pointing to his blood that will be poured out. Um, for sin. And then after this, Jesus takes his disciples and he goes into the garden of Gethsemane. Now, this was an olive grove just outside the city of Jerusalem at the base of the Mount of Olives. Jesus went here frequently, more than uh, once he had spent the night here. And so Jesus goes back to this uh, fairly familiar place with his disciples. And As he enters the Garden of Gethsemane, he begins to be very troubled. Now, it's interesting that the word Gethsemane literally means olive press. And, um, you know, not surprisingly, since it was an olive grove, there was an olive press here. And this is where they would press the olives. And the the olive oil would, of course, flow out from the olives. It's highly symbolic because it is here in the Garden of Gethsemane that Jesus Christ begins to be crushed with the guilt, the weight of human sin. But it's because he was willing to be uh, crushed, so to speak, by sin for us, that um, the life-giving oil of the Holy Spirit uh, can be promised to us. So highly significant that Jesus goes here to Gethsemane in the final hours of his life. However, I want to focus here on something that Jesus says to his disciples. You know, he knows what's coming. He realizes he is about to be arrested. He's about to be separated from his disciples, and he knows that they are not ready for this trial. You know, earlier that evening and in the days previous, again, Jesus had tried to warn them about what was going to happen, and the disciples had all been very confident that they would stick by Jesus' side, that they would fight for him, that they would even be willing to die for him. And um, Jesus realized better than they the nature of the um, conflict that they were about to step into. And so Jesus says to his disciples in Matthew chapter 26, uh, verse 36, I'll just read the verse. Then came Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane and said unto the disciples, sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. And he said, my soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And um, and don't have time to look at all of what is happening here, but I will just summarize this by saying that Jesus is quoting from an Old Testament prophecy in the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, which speaks of the sufferings of the Messiah. And the last couple verses of Isaiah chapter 53 um, actually contains the verse that Jesus is quoting here. And it talks about how when... Um, the guilt of sin is placed on the Messiah. He would pour out his soul as an offering for sin. Jesus is quoting this, this passage here, um, trying to let his disciples know that it is at this moment here in the garden of Gethsemane, that the guilt of all human sin is being placed upon him. And it's literally crushing out his life right here in Gethsemane. So this is a spiritual struggle. This is a spiritual crisis, um, that surrounds Jesus and the disciples. Now, it's true, there is a physical battle as well, because we know that in a few minutes, Judas, the disciple that betrays Jesus, he's going to show up with um, the leaders of the Jews, with Roman guards, with a mob as well, and they're going to physically arrest Jesus. So there is definitely, can we say, the political aspect going on as well. But first and foremost, This is a spiritual battle, and Jesus wants his disciples to be ready for this spiritual battle. In the Gospel of Luke, looking at the same story, Jesus says this. This is Luke chapter 22, verse 40. And he said unto them, his disciples, pray that you enter not into temptation. And so we see here that Christ's greatest uh, concern for his disciples was not that they understand the, the political or external events that were about to happen. 
Now, yes, again, he had warned them, he's going to be arrested, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be arrested, I'm going to be crucified. But, you know, he could have laid out before them exactly the exact time, the exact sequence of what would happen in the garden as Judas comes, uh, who would be with him, what the alliance of evil powers would be. He could have laid out for them step by step, minute by minute, what would happen between his arrest and his crucifixion. Uh, Jesus doesn't do that. Instead, he says, pray that you enter not into temptation. And again, I want to make sure that we understand this is a lesson for us today. Let's apply this to us today. What is the most important purpose of Bible prophecy? Is it to help us understand every single um, aspect of the political situation that may happen in the world to lay out exact charts and sequences of, you know, what's going to happen as this nation fights against this one and I don't believe that's the case. If we take the lesson here from the Garden of Gethsemane, the most important thing for us today is the most important thing that was also true for the disciples then, and that is that we don't enter into temptation. It's a spiritual battle first, a physical battle second. Now, you know, when Jesus tells his disciples, don't enter into temptation, maybe that sounds like kind of a strange uh, command, you know, how, how are we, how are we as humans supposed to avoid temptation? I mean, we live in a sinful world. If you believe what the Bible says, uh, you believe that we are fallen. We have a fallen nature. We are, uh, you know, born in this sinful condition. So how can Jesus tell his disciples, you know, pray that you enter not into temptation? Well, we'll, we'll look at that in a moment here. Let's look at the rest of this story here, because in Matthew 26, verse 56, as we jump ahead a little bit in the story, Judas comes, you know, the bad guys come, they arrest Jesus. And when that happens, his disciples flee from him. Matthew 26, verse 56 says, but all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook Christ and fled. This should be a really disturbing verse to us if we apply its lesson for us today. Is it possible that even uh, many Christians today who study Bible prophecy, who think that they are prepared for the end, will be blindsided by the true issues, by the true uh, force of the situation, and will be unprepared just as the disciples were um, there in the Garden of Gethsemane? The, the Bible says, again, they all fled. They all forsook him. And uh, actually, in the book of Mark, uh, Mark's account of this night says that they all forsook him and fled. I'm sorry, this is Mark chapter 14, beginning in verse 50. They all forsook him and fled. And there followed him a certain young man, having a linen cloth cast about his naked body. And the young men laid hold on him, and he left the linen cloth and fled from them naked. Uh, so interesting little detail there in the book of Mark, you know, they fled from him so quickly and in such fear that um, one man, one young man even left his clothing behind. It's interesting in Revelation chapter 16, verse 15, um, that there is a similar passage here. Jesus says here, behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Now, Revelation chapter 16, verse 15 is right in the middle of the Bible's description of the sixth plague. And this is uh, the passage that speaks of Armageddon at the end of time and talks about the nations being gathered to fight against God. Uh, against God. And it speaks of this great uh, battle that will take place that certainly includes much physical warfare and fighting. There's politics going on here. But what is Christ's greatest focus, his greatest concern for his people today in this passage of Revelation? You know, he, again, he says here in Revelation 16, verse 15, Behold, I come as a thief. Uh, blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Just as it was in that night in Gethsemane, Christ's greatest concern for us today is not that we understand every single aspect of what will happen politically in this world. 
He wants us to be spiritually prepared, to be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Now, how do, how do we get clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ? Well, we ask forgiveness for our sins, and we ask for um, the blood of Christ to be applied to our life, just like that blood on the doorpost. And we ask that he will start living his life through us. This is what it means to live the Christian life, to walk the walk, um, to walk with Jesus. It means that he begins living his life through us. And um, as we do this, we have the promise that he will give us his power and his strength to overcome sin, to overcome temptation. A great promise in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. I want to go back to that question I asked just a minute ago. How could Jesus command his disciples or tell his disciples, pray that you enter not into temptation? You know, is Jesus telling us the same thing today? And how would we respond? You know, is it actually possible to avoid temptation? Well, I want to suggest, friends, that Jesus would never tell us to do something or give us a command to do something if it was not possible to do it with his power and with his help. We just read this promise in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, that there is no temptation uh, that we will confront or face in our lives that God cannot give us his power to overcome. Now, it's true we can't overcome sin or temptation on our own. We will fall every single time if we rely on our own supposed strength. But by claiming the power of Jesus Christ, by asking him to give us his strength, uh, we have the assurance that there is nothing in this life that uh, God will allow us to face that we cannot remain faithful to God through. And this is a promise that we need just as much as the disciples needed that promise there in the Garden of Gethsemane. Well, we're just about out of time, friends. I hope that you have been uh, blessed by the time that we have spent in God's Word. Just a reminder that if you would like to um, get your free copy of my book, How to Prepare for the End, which includes um, you know, a summary of today's study, you can call us toll-free at 855-447-8788. That's 855-HIS-TRUTH. Or go online to pathwaytoparadise.org and use offer code PREPARE. And you can get your free copy of that book. Thank you. I've enjoyed this study, and I hope that you'll join me again next time. You have been listening to Pictures of the End, a production of Pathway to Paradise Ministries. Pictures of the End is available via your favorite podcast service and also at www.picturesoftheend.com.